Hey y'all, I'm Dan Hamilton, host of the Next Gen Warrior Show. As always, the Next Gen Warrior Show is brought to you by Chairman George P. Bush and the Texas Veterans Land Board. Today, I am joined by Carl Snyder, and he is the Managing Director and Chief Market Strategist of Vets Index. And uh, Carl is kind enough to join us all the way from PA. Carl, how are you doing today? And thanks for being on the program with us. Hey, thank you. First and foremost, uh, thank you for having me. Pleasure, and I'm doing great. Uh, tell us about your military service before we get into Vets Indexes and kind of your career progression. Sure. So I'm not as young as a lot of the veterans out there. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, I was in from 92 to 96. Uh, I, as we stated, I, I was in the Marine Corps, served for four years, uh, was in, art, was, uh, in artillery, and um, had the opportunity to be on a MEW that was uh, sent to Somalia, uh, which was an interesting place to be uh, in 1994. And uh, it, it was great traveling. I mean, that's the one thing I miss, well, multiple things, but traveling and, and being with my buddies is one of the things that really uh, was fantastic about the Corps. And I know on a previous conversation, I had told you, I'll let everybody know, we were part of that MU that had come back um, from Somalia. And it, we just got back right before July 4th. And again, picture the time frame. this is 1994, so cell phones weren't prevalent. Uh, we had all just got cut loose on a 96. Um, all gear was still ready to go, and uh, that's when there was a um, humanitarian crisis and et cetera going on in Haiti. We felt the need as a country that we needed to help out there. So I'm home on 4th of July weekend, as a lot of the guys were in the court and other branches, but our MU, we got called back, and my father was able down at a buddy's house on July 4th and uh, we had a report back. <laughs> you guys were shooting off fireworks and drinking beer and all of a sudden literally duty does call, huh? Uh, absolutely. So, so that, you know, when, when you say force and readiness, you, you, you truly are because we all had 24 hours to get back and, and we were back and had our gear good to go and we were back out on ships again. So tell us about VETS indexes. Uh, you've been in, in the finance industry since you left the military for your service to the country. And uh, I know you were kind of uh, searching around, trying to find something that you were passionate about and uh, something that you wanted to do where you could continue to lead and serve. Um, what is VETS indexes? Sure. Well, VETS indexes, being that I was in the financial services for a long time, I got to meet a lot of great people. So with that, with what VETS indexes is, it's an index of companies, publicly traded companies, that based on different studies, different surveys, different data and recognitions awards that we put together after meeting criteria are displaying best practices for hiring and re retaining veterans. And of course, we could talk more about that and I can drill down, but that's what the index is itself. We're about the veteran employment mentoring and the main thing is when talking about uh veteran hiring it's great no matter what everybody needs a job we really want to talk about giving uh veterans uh an opportunity to build a new career so mentorship programs at new companies etc uh like i said it's great to get a job but we want to find out where these uh, men and women who serve can come home, use their abilities and capabilities and, and put them into full practice. Or even if they want to change them, being the fact that uh, military personnel are so versatile and all the things that they can do, we wanted to make sure that companies are really creating that culture for veterans to come in, um, get it transitioned over to the team uh, that they're now going to belong to and, and have an opportunity to excel at a, a new career. So how much have you seen uh, just industry practices change or businesses change their approach to hiring veterans over the last five to 10 years? Yeah, I mean, it's definitely getting better. There's more organizations. Um, government is doing a better job. So there, you, what you're seeing now, I would say, is a lot of how um, nonprofit organizations and companies are working together also with companies, uh, excuse me, also with government entities, how it's actually everybody kind of is working together 
getting on the same sheet as far as, you know, veterans really bring a unique skill set to the workforce. So what I'm seeing is that companies and all of the other organizations are working more together. They're, they're helping each other out. They're just not setting up their own veterans programs that you're seeing a, a lot more collaboration is really where I'm going for on that. Yeah. And, and before you were the managing director and chief market strategist at Vets Indexes, I, I know we had a brief conversation a, a week or two ago and you talked about after you got out of the military and, and you were kind of searching for uh, passion, you were looking for a way to serve. Can you talk to us about uh, before you were in a leadership position, what your uh, approach was, maybe what some of the struggles were, and kind of what the process for your career development after the military looked like? Sure. Um, like I said, I came home in 96. So I've been out for quite a while now. Uh, this was pre 9 11. Um, so at that time, it was people and organizations were like, it was great that you were in the military, but there wasn't as much as far as companies and programs looking to help uh, veterans come home and transition. It was basically, you had to do all the legwork, which really is not a hard thing for veterans. I mean, we're used to working hard, but you know, you're, you're in one area and then you're trying to transition over. So opportunities, you're trying to look for a lot of different things. So what, what I was trying to do is, okay, where am I going next uh, with, with my life and career? I, I want to serve. Um, at the same time, I want to build a good career. So I had a couple of jobs in the beginning, had to start work right away. You know, I know I wasn't going to come home and try to figure it out. <laughs> that, that definitely was Did you get out and go, go, to, go back to college? Did you take some classes or did you get, you tried to get directly into industry? Well, I didn't try to get directly into the industry. I still was trying to figure it out a little bit, Dan. Um, I, uh, I mentioned to you, I had a CDL license before I went into the Marine Corps. It was to help pay for college. This is back in the day when you didn't have to be 21. You could be 18 and have your class A driver's license. Um, so I was doing that a little bit before I went into the Corps. When I came home, literally, I came home, I got discharged on the, uh, on the 15th weekend i came home on a sunday night march 15th that is in 96 i came home on a sunday night and i was working on a monday um and the reason why i wasn't just going to sit around and figure it out i said i have to just go back to work i'm not going to take vacation uh, i want to get after you know just getting back into work no matter what i have to you know support myself etc so i was fortunate enough that my father he was a dispatcher and i was able to utilize my cdl license you know, with the company that he was at. So that was a fortunate thing. But during that time is when I started to really start thinking more and more about what it was that I wanted to do. Um, what was the career path? Where, where did I envision myself going down the road? But at the same time, the, the main thing was the camaraderie of the core and also leadership. Uh, you know, I served as an NCO. So I, I definitely wanted to continue to serve and, and see what I could do to help. So. When I was younger, finance was always something that I looked at and said, this is an interesting field. Like, and, like when you were in high school or something, it was of interest to you or while you were in the Marine Corps? Um, I, I could say even before high school, uh, you know, I always, you'll hear me refer to my dad a lot, but he was very influential in a lot of things. But my mom was too, in case my mom does see this. <laughs> mom, you, you, were, you were very influential. <laughs> sure you, both of us. You, you picked the, you helped out to transition uh, those conversations with that. But um with my dad, I, I liked numbers growing up, and for some reason, I, I thought the stock market was really cool. Um, and my dad, old school style, would sit and sit down with the Wall Street Journal with me. Now, my dad, again, dispatcher on the pier, it wasn't like he was corporate white collar America, you know. But he had a uh, knack for investing, or he had a, uh, a I don't want to say a passion for it, but he he enjoyed it and. So he said, all right, let's go, I'll show you. And, you know, we started looking at Wall Street Journal probably when I was in middle school. And he would, we would look actually in the paper. Again, this is all big before big time apps, smartphones and everything else. And when stocks actually traded with fractions as opposed to decimals. So that's kind of how I got my first taste of finance or the markets, if you will. Um. I mean, that's just an incredible kind of like transition. You know, I, it was funny. I was looking at something the other day and they were talking about reading the Wall Street Journal. And even I can remember, I'm, I'm uh, 
uh, in my mid thirties. And I, even I can remember people going and looking at the newspaper to see, you know, what had happened in the markets the next day. Uh, <laughs> we've really seen, I guess, a, a transition from the way that uh, markets are tracked and, and the way that they're watched. But to go back to the story with, with you and your dad, uh, you decided to, I guess, continue to, to nurture that 10 or 15 years later. Yeah, I did. And so um, I was trying to figure out how do I get into the financial industry? Um, and again, this is going back, I'm dating myself a lot, but hey, it's all right. Um, <laughs> this is when- the wiser. <laughs> this is when, so the, how I got into the financial industry is it was, a, it was an ad in the newspaper when they still had the classifieds in the newspaper and that was still your primary source. And it was American Express before they um, spun off Ameriprise Financial. So it was American Express Financial Advisors was starting a training program for financial advisors. I had always thought of myself as more of a money manager or a big time trader, but I said, let me at least get into the field this way and it's going to help others you know, with their personal finances as well. So it's kind of dual-fold. I can get into the financial industry and then pro hopefully help others do well with their investments and set up their financial planning. So that was how I got my entry into the financial industry. I went through the classes with finance, uh, American Express Financial Advisors and went through that. And that, that's, that was the start of uh, the financial career. You would say, though, that that wasn't your vision when you got out of the military of what your, your post service career would look like. Cause I, I just want to highlight this real quick. I think there is uh, sometimes it's good to pick a track or pick a, a passion that you have, but sometimes the way that it's, you know, plotted on the graph looks a little bit different than what you maybe would have expected it, but you had to start somewhere. You had to take, take a chance right. and see if you enjoyed it. Well, sure. I mean, it's not what I had envisioned. I didn't envision being a financial planner, American Express financial advisors. That's not a knock to them, but that's just not where I saw myself. And hopefully this can help others, whether it's veterans or young men and women coming out of college or those out of high school deciding what to do next. You kind of get an overview, big picture of where or I think more, not even what you want to do per se, but who you want to be the person you want to be because if you're true to yourself and and the person you want to be you may have to take some st steps and start somewhere but it's going to help you become who you want to be and eventually hopefully get you to doing what you want to do in different aspects i mean let's face it not everybody has the perfect job um but we all have i think our passions of who we want to be what we want to do. So I knew that when I came out of the Marine Corps, I, I still wanted to serve. I definitely wanted to serve. I, I wanted to be, and this is a little bit about my faith, is I've always said I wanted to become the man God intended me to be. And, I, and to this day, I'm 47 years old. I will continue to work on that till my last breath, becoming the man that, yes. So with that being said, trying to become the man that God wants me to be, that I want to become, and then also the way that I envision career paths. Um, it didn't start out with American Express, but it was me trying to figure out, I definitely want to be able to help others. And then I realized I like the financial industry. So it was trying to marry those two things together. So it wasn't that, like you said, it wasn't the natural uh, thing to pick, but it was the way to get my foot into the door um, at that time. No, and that's such, that's such a crucial message. I, I think you, you pointed it out so well there that it's not just for the veterans community. And that, that's maybe the, the one thing that I, I love about our program is, is trying to use the personal and professional advice from veterans for the community at large. So that uh, the lessons that you have, how you approached your career, the opportunities that you took, uh, mm -hmm. And the desire, like you said, to marry a few things together was what you were going for. But the concept of just getting your foot in the door, getting into the industry or being in the room, uh, it may not be the door that you had uh, initially wanted it to be. But there's a stream out of value. Just just get on the, uh, get on the escalator. Just get on the elevator. Even if it's not the, the floor that you, you thought you would be getting on at, just be there. 
Yes, no, absolutely, Dan, and, and you articulated well. Be there, take that first step. So I'm actually interested, real quick. I'm gonna you know, go back to uh, go back to the days of reading the journal with your father. Was there a company? Was there an industry that you enjoyed following back then? That, that when you when you think back, you think fondly of it. You know, um, at that time, it was a lot of you know. We're talking about with talking with my dad now. Uh, in, in earlier years, we're talking about the mid '80s. Um, so we're talking about a lot of industry. There was technology, but not technology like we see today. So it, it was big U.S. industry, uh, like 3M, General Motors, Boeing, companies like that that were, quote, unquote, the stalwarts. It was always interesting because they represent what was going on with the American economy. And, you know, my dad was, and that was strictly tied to what he did. He worked uh, in the pier, on the piers. He was a dispatcher, but, you know, trade, shipping and everything had a lot to do with his, you know, his role as, as a uh, dispatcher for a container repair company. So it was kind of, that was kind of the way that it went. Yeah, it's it's an interesting, and that's, that's one of the reasons that I've, I've found myself uh, really interested in watching the markets over the last year or two because it, it like your dad, uh, like you said for for your father, it it allows me to understand the macro trends at a micro level. So I can mm-hmm. I can go read the journal or I can watch CNBC. I can read business news. I can I can understand what's going on with employment numbers or or even health and safety uh, during COVID. Uh, but then I can go out and I can approach my daily life and I can start to either draw some parallels or mm-hmm. I can maybe compare and contrast from what I'm seeing at a macro level uh, versus what's happening in, in my day to day life or even what's happening with, you know, my friends jobs and what's happening in my community. And, you know, we live here in Austin, so we've, we've had a, a massive amount of, of tech jobs move into the area. But, you know, it's great for uh, especially a lot of young people who are leaving University of Texas, St. Ed's, Austin Community College. And I think that's maybe some of the trends that you were talking about was the ability to see the macro things that are going on, like you said, with 3M or Boeing or, or GM, and then also the impact that it was having on your dad at the peers in his daily work. Yeah, no, absolutely. And, and that's what I think, you know, a lot of times with investing and just in life and economics. It's good to read up on those things. It's, I have a passion for the markets in addition to everything else I do. I like the markets, makes a lot of sense. I like math, but you know, we can kind of use anecdotal evidence a lot of times as well, kind of see what's going on in our daily lives. Also seeing what's going on with our friends, family, neighbors, and kind of then listen to the, the, the news, read headlines, and then hopefully go dive deeper than the headlines. Sometimes headlines do sensationalize what's going on out there. Sometimes we've got to dig deeper a little bit and get under the hood and read a little bit. But we are able then to kind of, you know, put things together and, and connect the dots of what is all going on. Um, so, you know, yeah. And, and I know that uh, your job right now, you do a lot of uh, analysis and you do a lot of research you know, what are you researching? What are you looking at for somebody who may be interested in going into uh, the finance industry or or maybe someone who is is just interested uh, from, like I said, a a macro perspective on uh, understanding the finance industry more. When you're doing market research, when you're doing analysis or analysis of a business, can you, you know, provide us a little understanding of, of what you try to look at? Yeah, I like to look at, uh, you know, from a macro point, I, I do look at the markets, like what kind of a trend they're in, whether they're up trends, down trends. Um, markets typically will lead economics, not always the case, but predominantly because their thoughts, they're, they're discounting what future profits and expectations typically are. So I look at a lot of macro themes as far as trends and, and the markets as a whole, as far as the trends and patterns of what's going on within that. But then as far as companies, when we're talking more, I, I like to see what, what their sales are, what their revenues are. You know, we're in a period where we talk about a lot, you have quarterly earnings and they're good to a certain expect, but I think sometimes companies have to manage, uh, sometimes they're not managing their businesses uh, the way that they want 
they're trying to manage expectations of analysts and investors. And yes, investors, they're public companies, so they have to give back shareholder value. But there's a lot of um, great work being done, and it's kind of a little bit off, but I think it's important to mention it. There's some great work being done by an organization called Just, J-U-S-T, Just Capital. Um, they're out of New York, and they talk about not just shareholder value, but stakeholder value when com with companies. And it kind of lends into what I feel about veterans and what they bring to the table, but they look at it from a, a much different level also from the people who are shareholders, stakeholders, not veterans, but all employees. Like companies that run themselves, corporate governance really is the key. Companies that run themselves for the good of the company, for the good of the employees, where stakeholders, everybody from the young men or whether they're not young or older, from the men and women who come in the morning and sit in the C-suite to the people on the front lines of an assembly line, to those who are out in the field making decisions, to investors who are hedge funds, to the impact it's going to have on communities where these companies operate. So they talk about stakeholder value and they're doing a lot of good work. And we noticed this, uh, a lot of the companies, they have what comes out as a, they're just 100 companies every year. A lot of those companies, in fact, are in our VETS indexes. So it goes to show you, one of the main things is corporate governance. Companies and that govern boards, that govern their companies, you know, the, the sayings out there for the greater good. What is the greater good? It can fall down to many different prospects or aspects, depending upon what you look at, but not just the return on equity. That's an important thing, return on equity, but there's more than just return on equity. It's the quality of life that you're providing people, what you're doing in the neighborhoods you serve. There's, com there's a lot of companies that do great things in, in where they have their, either their plants or where they have their corporate offices, that they give back, et cetera. So those are a lot of things that I look at a lot more too. And then also to be more direct uh, when it comes to vets indexes, I'm always looking at companies, seeing what they're doing within their veteran initiatives and veteran programs, talk to a lot of people within those companies. And Dan, one of the things I know in a brief conversation we had before, but I mentioned it here is when it comes to veteran hiring and initiatives and mentorships, the companies that have these programs in place they truly are all are on the same team, even though they want to see, for example, I'll say AT&T, Verizon, you know, they, they're two wireless companies, great companies that do great things for veterans and lots of others. They want to hire the best. They want to hire veterans that will help them, but they will share ideas. Um, and I'm just using them as an example. They will share ideas to help veterans get hired no matter what. So if you're talking and then also with, uh, the financial industry, Veterans on Wall Street, uh, VOWS, VOWS, they go by VOWS, Veterans on Wall Street, they're looking about how to help veterans get hired within the workplace in the financial industry. And they're spreading out now just beyond the financial industry. They're just talking about veteran hiring and best practices for companies as a whole. So there's no competition then. It's all about helping the veterans. So who they're working for, even though they're working, they may work at JP Morgan, they may work at City, they may work at General Electric. All these different companies that are doing great things for veterans and part of the vets indexes, et cetera, they're, I feel like they're truly working for veterans. I, I, I really do. From my conversations with them, from the conferences that we host, and we can talk more about that shortly. But when you speak to these people, and a lot of them are veterans, not the whole uh, team within their veteran uh, initiatives, but some of the, um, the leaders of their veteran hiring initiatives or their vet, uh, employee resource groups, a lot of veterans, a lot of people, and a lot of them are just um, volunteering their time to help their uh, employee resource groups. So there's a lot of great things going on, but they're working for their veterans. So I know we kind of veered off course a little bit, but it all comes about, that's how I'm looking at companies and trying to not just value companies, but see what's going on and what's, what they're doing overall for, for the veteran community. No, that's incredible. I, I'm, I'm actually interested to know because you have such a knowledge, uh, a depth of interest and a passion for the finance industry. And like you said earlier, you were able to marry that with your interest in finance and investing and money management. Was there ever a time you thought you might be in a different industry? 
Sure. <laughs> um, the finance, especially in the early years of the finance, not so, not now, um, but in the early years of the financial industry, it's tough. It's tough to get started. Um, it's tough to, you know, gain clientele to get a, it's, even though you're working for a company, you, you, it's, you're, you're in your own small business, if you will. So it's, it's tough. It's a, it's a grind in the beginning, especially when you're a personal financial advisor, uh, you know, Later in my career, I became a research analyst and a strategist, and I was working more on a higher level than directly with individual clients. So it changed, and, and that's really where things got very interesting because I was modeling and building portfolios um, and trying to then really help people with their investments specifically and help advisors build good investments or build port good portfolios for their clients to invest in. But yeah, definitely in the early stages, and I can't say there was one, any one thing I was looking at. Uh, you know, if there was anything that just came to my head right now in the early stages and maybe even before I really took that next transition to more of a leadership role in the financial industry, I had thought about um, public service, whether it was going to be uh, fire department or, 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 or police department at that time, because it was something uh, they share a lot of camaraderie and, and they definitely serve. They definitely serve. Um, so those were the two off the that, top. That of would have been your, your only kind of inkling of like, hey, maybe there's something else out there it was right before you were about to take more of a leadership or management position. Yeah, I'd say so. I probably leaned a lot more towards the fire, fire department because of, uh, I don't know, it could be a million different reasons, but a lot of pr protecting, but anything within, you know, public service, that type of way where I could help others. Now, in 2013 or 2014, uh, you had a group of guys that had got together, and really, you started to share your passion for veterans with this group. Uh, can you talk to us about kind of the initial development of the Vets Indexes and, and investing with a focus on veteran hiring? Sure. So, so it's at that time where I, I met some really – I met a lot of great people. But at that time, I met people, like-minded people at that time who were doing their different things within the financial industry. They had a couple different companies going. They were more in the data side of and doing research just within the markets itself. But uh, one of the guys I met at that time, um, and I was a strategist for uh, another registered investment advisor. We just started talking, we met at a conference um, and we just hit it off. His father was a Marine and then served in uh, a New York City Police Department. And this is years ago. Uh, and we just started talking more and more about the industry. So, but we always talked about veteran initiatives and causes at that time. And there was a group of us at that time that were just always talking about veteran causes. So it was never really a vets index at that time. It was just always saying, you know, what do you think, how can we get people to realize what veterans bring to the table and the hiring practices of veterans. So it was just more than, than business. It was just more of what we could do just to help others out really at that time. It was more of just almost a discussion or something of an interest that you all had. So was there a catalyst then that, that made you start uh, to move from the point where it was just a conversation to actually maybe looking at some of these businesses or talking about creating a fund or where you went from the conceptual to the concrete? Yeah, I, I would say that kind of, so the talk started early, but then I would say more like in 2016 and then going into 2017 is when it's really started becoming, we, we started doing the research on it. Like, you know what, this just makes sense. What, what can we do to put this into practice? Like, is there something, you know, we're, we're all established in our careers. Is there something that we can do with our careers that will help veterans besides just networking. Um, so we started saying, you know what, let's look at companies because we, we knew about indexes. We knew, that was one of the big things. We knew a lot about indexes and indices, you know, indexes are anything to track stocks, whether it's the S&P 500 or biotech index. So we started saying, well, what about an index of companies that hire veterans? It was, that, that was the, I say first 30,000 foot view. So that was like, okay, where do we go from here? You know, companies that hire veterans. And then we started talking about it more and, and I'm generalizing a lot, but you know, we started to hammer things out. Like well, we, it's gotta be more than just companies that hire veterans. We've got to base it on something a little bit more concrete and quantifiable data. 
So we started looking into a lot of companies and organizations, whether private or public companies, or do a lot of survey data based on best practices of veterans. So we started to look at that. We started to look at all the survey data that was out there. And we started to then put together, okay, these surveys, they're kind of drawing, they're, they're, they're putting a map together for us of companies that do have best practices and initiatives for veterans. So we said, let's come up with this index of companies that are publicly traded because with an index, they have to be publicly traded companies. Let's put together an index of companies that are best practices for veterans. And that started with a lot of companies, a lot of surveys, but we started to whittle it down more and more. We started to put um, companies that spent X amount of dollars with their veteran initiatives as far as hiring programs. How many uh, hiring programs do you go to? How many bases or uh, installations do you reach out to? Uh, how many veterans do you hire? What's the ratio of veterans of hiring? So all those types of details and uh, analytics, we started to get those together from the different survey data. And then after looking at all those and different awards that companies won, we said, all right, we've got something to work with here. We started compiling it, narrowing the list down. And then after we narrowed the list down and put it, we're able to you know, quantify the material best as you can with survey data. We wanted to then back test because no matter what, if it's going to be an investment thesis, you need the investment. It doesn't have to be the greatest thing, but you wanna make sure that people are gonna say the investment works, right? So uh, instead of just a great idea that, yeah, it makes a lot of sense to hire veterans, of course, but why? Why does it hire veterans? So we started back, test, back testing the data and back to 2012 up to currently, we said, we took the companies that were in the index uh, created and back tested that index up to now to see how it would perform against their peer group. And we say the peer group of the S&P 500 because that's a broad index of investable com companies. And it's the index has been significantly outperforming the S&P 500. I don't say that to say great job by us. I go to say it holds water. Our thesis holds water that uh, tapping into this pool of candidates who can come to work for you, not only is very good, very patriotic, a way to help pay them back for the, all their sacrifices, but it's gonna help your bottom line. It's going to create an atmosphere at work where you have these people who have great skill sets, both from intangibles and tangibles, to come into practice, to work at your companies, and where you can mentor them. And you look at some of these organizations, C-suite executives, have spent time in, in, the, in the military, you know, what different branches, um, et cetera. So it held a lot of water. So it had to make sense also from just a pure investment standpoint. So now you get to both best of both worlds, if you will. You're doing uh, a, a great service for veterans. You're making sure companies are, are paying, you know, helping veterans come into the workforce and develop careers that they can now continue their lives and take care of their families after they've done and sacrificed so much for us. That's amazing. So I'm interested to know a little bit about the, the your management perspective, maybe your style at Vets Index is now, now that you've had uh, a chance to be in, in a leadership role for, for several years, can you talk about maybe something that, that you enjoy about leadership and maybe something that you find a little bit more challenging or something that doesn't come as natural to you? Um, you know, I'm fortunate enough right now with at Vets that as far as when you said not come natural for you, I, I, I've been in the financial industry for a long time. Maybe if I would have started this out, it would have been different at that time. If I would have came right into trying to run a Vets Index or be in a Vets Indexes when I first came out of the Marine Corps, the transitioning from military is life to civilian life. But I've been a civilian, even though he's a Marine at heart, but I've been a civilian for a long time now. So, um, <laughs> and, and, and I not any people that walk down the hallway or anything like that anymore. <laughs> you know, I, I still, I still blurt out a lot. I, I still can be loud. I, I, you know, just real quick, when we have our conferences, you know, the, the polite way, at conferences, a lot of time, a gentleman will go around uh, in the break room and start ringing the little bell, ding, 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 <laughs> and they may do, and, and they do that still at our conferences. But sometimes we need a little bit more call of action. So 
they say, hey, Carl, can you get everybody into back into the conference room? And uh, I'm happy to do so. You get to reach ne- out. It's you never intimidating. Get that Marine voice out again, huh? Yeah, I, I dig deep a little bit. And, and everybody looks. Some laugh. Some look and are like, who's this guy? But who the hell is this people, guy? Yeah. <laughs> a lot of people do know who I am. And I can't say that's necessarily always a good thing, Dan. <laughs> but uh, going back to your, your question of, of leadership, um, you know, being that in the Marine Corps really helped me to formulate a, a leadership style, um, especially being deployed overseas. Um, and that's one of the great things too about men and women, the deployments uh, that they're on. Almost everyone is on deployment in different branches. Some are fortunate where they don't have to necessarily be on a deployment uh, necessarily in Afghanistan or Iraq, but they're deployed different parts, but they get to experience things. But those who are deployed to, you know, some of the hot zones, hot beds, if you will, you, you, it's, it's hard to articulate the leadership that has to be won there and then the way that you have to lead there. It, it's, uh, it, it's hard to articulate that, to be quite honest, but there's something within the young men and women because even people say, well, they're not young women and women. Yeah, 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 they are. <laughs> you know, yeah. you don't realize you have staff, NCOs, and uh, first lieutenants and captains who, who are in their 20s. You know, yeah, early 20s sometimes, you, too. You know, you forget that. And some, you've got these people who are, are in charge of multiple people, millions and millions of dollars worth of government equipment who have to make decisions that, you know, not always life and death, but are very important decisions and sometimes life and death decisions. So I would say, going back to my Marine Corps days, all the training I had, the mentorship that was available to me in the Marine Corps that allowed me to now, you know, since the time I came out of the Marine Corps and anytime I had a leadership role in different aspects of different organizations, whether in the financial industry and then, you know, whether it was doing uh, voluntary nonprofits, it was always instilled to me, but you have to win trust though. You, you can't command or demand respect. You can't command or demand uh, that you are the leader. You, if you come across and you need to assert that you're the, or feel that you need to assert that you're the leader, I think you need to figure out a different leadership style. And that's why I, I mentioned um, General Mattis's book. It, it's great for anybody, for businesses to, it talks a lot about leadership. Um, and, and when you lead, um, you know, we, we, we sometimes envision what people do as leaders or, or what they are. Leaders are servants. Le- leaders, the best leaders are servants. Um, I, I truly definitely believe that to be the case. So if you're serving and there are leadership qualities, you have to be able to think uh, quickly. You have to be able to take initiative. You, and the one thing you, you definitely have to serve as a leader, but one of the thing is, uh, and I'll steal this from Jocko, um, extreme ownership. You've got to be able to own everything. Uh, take, you know, take all responsibility, whether it's good, bad, and different. You're, you're responsible for everything. And when it comes to receiving credit, it's because of the team that helps you get there. But you definitely have to take extreme ownership of what you're doing. So if you want to lead, that's one thing I would pass on to anyone who's aspiring to lead or is currently in a leadership role. You never, if you're being asked tough questions, it falls on you. I, I've always felt that way. When I've ever been asked tough questions, I never said, well, this wasn't done. And I asked someone sort of do this. Ultimately, the reason why it was done wasn't done, or where the things happened is because of me. And I truly believe that. Uh, if you really want to lead, it's ultimately all falls on you. And that may be a hard way to look at it, but if you're leading, you're building those teams. So it's you. <laughs> it, it, it is you. Absolutely. And before we go here, I, I, I want to address something. If you're a veteran who is, is listening to this and they go, how do I find my way to Wall Street? How do I find my way into the finance industry? What's your advice to them? I, I would say your, your best tool is uh, technology. For example, the internet. Go on the internet. Social media sometimes gets a bad name, but if you can get out to, you know, silence all the noise and negativity. There's a lot of positive 
things going on. And that's how I built a lot of great relationships over the years, whether it's Twitter, whether it's uh, different social media platforms, LinkedIn, et cetera. Follow organizations, get to know people at these organizations. Uh, like I said, look at Val's website, Veterans on Wall Street. Follow people on Twitter who are, you know, looking to help people. Go on LinkedIn. There's a lot on LinkedIn. Um, and just Google search uh, um, mentorship programs for Wall Street. Um, look at the Bob Woodruff Foundation. It's another organization that teams up. There, I mean, I'm only mentioning a few, but there's so many organizations out there that really weren't available to me uh, or that I didn't know of, but they really, there wasn't the social media platforms. Get on social media for the good. Look at people who are out there trying to help talk to people. And I've noticed that, and I tell you, all veterans, almost every veteran I've come across will help. I'm not saying that they're always going to be able to get you a job or they're going to make every introduction, but even if it's just a bit of advice, veterans there are, are, are there to help. They really are, man. They, they, there is that esprit de corps of amongst all veterans that they want to help you. So reach out to them, reach out. I'm on social media, reach out to me. And I'm serious. It may take me sometimes a little bit of time, but I try to get back to anyone who ever reaches out to me. It's not saying I can get everybody a job, but if I can say I can help you with one thing or modify a resume to this, things like that. Well, Carl, thank you so much for, for sharing your advice and, and uh, also just sharing your perspective on the industry and what your lessons learned have been over your career. Is there anything else that you would like to uh, leave our audience with today? We'll, we'll uh, allow you to have the last word. Sure. Um, continue to serve. And as you serve, serve for the good of all. And if you serve for the good of all, it is going to help you to become the person that you want to be. And that's going to help you to become where and go where you want in your career. But continue to serve and people see that. Carl, thanks for being on the program with us today. I really appreciate you sharing your insights with us. Thanks, Dan. Appreciate it. Absolutely. On behalf of Chairman George P. Bush and the Texas Veterans Land Board, that concludes another episode of the Next Gen Warrior Show. We will see you back here next Monday. Once again, thank you for joining us. We'll talk to you next week. Follow us on Instagram at Voices of Vets, on Twitter at Voice of Veterans, and on Facebook at Facebook.com slash Voices of Veterans. To hear more, please visit VoicesOfVeterans.org. Join us in sharing the success stories of Texas veterans. Thank you for joining us for the Next Gen Warrior Podcast.